Today we are going to be having uh, Jonathan, who thank you so much for coming in to talk about uh, cataloging, so train of catalogers and the way they should go. This is a presentation. I just wanted to thank our sponsors. So Mobius is actually going to be uh, sponsoring the captioning for this track, and I put a link in the chat, but we'll period periodically put them in there. And of course, for the Evergreen Community Development Initiative for the platform sponsor, without them, we wouldn't be able to be using Hopin and making this possible. So thank you very much for our sponsors. Uh, this is a recorded session, so uh, we'll be available after the conference is over. And if you have any questions for Jonathan, feel free to post them in the chat, and I will let him know. So whenever you're ready, Jonathan, you can take it away. Alrighty, well, um, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. It is really an honor for me to be here. My name is Jonathan Moore. I'm the cataloger at Wyandison Public Library, a small public library in southeastern Pennsylvania, just outside of the city of Redden. And more to the point of what I will be speaking with you about today, I also serve as chair of the cataloging committee for SPARC, Pennsylvania's statewide evergreen consortium. SPARC has recently completed a very extensive project where we have completely rethought our approach to cataloging, how we structure our permissions, how we provide training, and how we certify our catalogers. And during the next 45 minutes or so, I would like to tell you about our journey. Here is a very rough outline of what I will be covering today. I'll start by sharing a little about our consortium, our history, our unique characteristics, and how these impacted our cataloging environment. Next, I'll focus on the cataloging issues that we faced, the things that made us feel that change was necessary. Then I'll give our strategy for addressing the problems. After that, I will go into the gritty details of putting our strategy into practice. And finally, I'll close with a few, I'll close with a few words on the results and on the lessons that we learned along the way. So in order to understand why we chose to do what we did, there are a number of unique characteristics about our consortium that I probably should explain to you. Spark has been in existence for roughly a decade. We started as a group of about two dozen libraries and library systems scattered across Pennsylvania, and we all began using Evergreen in late 2011 and 2012. In terms of what our consortium is like today, the first thing to point out is that there has been a lot of growth. From the, origi from the original two dozen members, Spark now has more than 150 different libraries and systems. That means we've got a lot more people cataloging and we have a much larger, much more complex shared catalog. Beyond that, it's also important to note that Spark is not just a regional consortium. Our members are spread out, located across all parts of the map of Pennsylvania. However, Spark is statewide in a geographic sense, but not in an all-inclusive sense. There are plenty of libraries, plenty of systems that don't belong to us. And while some of our members on the map, many more of them are not. And within the list of member institutions, we are very, very diverse, both in terms of the size of the population that we serve and the number of librarians at each location. When you put all these factors together, they add up to a major difficulty for Spark, getting a sense of consortium-wide community making changes across all of Spark, getting all of our members to act in the same way has always been inherently difficult.
And when it comes to cataloging in Spark, specifically, there are a few more things to share. Uh, first, while we do share a catalog, have Spark-wide centralized cataloging. Every member is responsible for cataloging their own materials. We, uh, we've got a lot of cooks in our kitchen, as it were. Second, Spark does not have consortium-wide resource sharing. With very few exceptions, item records from each member don't really leave the domain. It makes it very easy for people to forget that their actions impact people at other places. And the cataloging staff at each location are wildly different. Some of our libraries have half a dozen or more people cataloging. Others, like Why Missing, just have one. Some of our people are full-time catalogers, people who went to grad school for it, who, for whatever reason, actually have a passion for it. And others are just kind of in the role by default because they're the only employee at their library and there's literally nobody else to do it. When you combine all of these with how decentralized Spark is as a whole, it breeds an environment where cataloging trouble is very likely to happen. And well, to be honest, we have faced our fair share of trouble. The quality of the mark records in our catalog, yeah, we just felt that it was not at a level that anyone was comfortable with. It wasn't acceptable, just in terms of the records that were imported and the records that were created. The standard was just not high enough. And there were also many, many changes that happened to our catalog that just should not have taken place. Mark records could be just edited randomly without notice. Records would be combined, merged together for no apparent reason. And finally, the duplicates. Good God, the duplicates. I, I don't have the words to describe how often this happened or how frustrating it was to all of us. Now, look, I know that all of these things will pop up to some degree in any shared catalog. And some of these things may happen to some degree when you do a system-wide change or when a new library migrates to your consortium. But the extent and the frequency of everything that was going on made it clear that bigger things were happening. Anyway, those are all of the bad things that people noticed, but in and of themselves, they weren't really the problem. They were just symptoms, side of the underlying cause. Us. There's no way to, there's really no polite way to say this. I mean, when you get right down to it, our catalogers were just not using Evergreen properly. Um, to be clear, I, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not saying that it was all of them or even the majority of them. And I'm not saying this out of blame or out of anger or, or out of any kind of malice. People were making honest mistakes. But the mistakes were still causing damage. And we needed to face the facts until we addressed this foundational cause of trouble. No other changes, no other improvements had a chance of lasting. So with the adoption of that premise, we had to do a little bit of introspection. And when we took a fresh look at our cataloging environment, we found three contributing factors the structure of our cataloging permissions, the lack of uniform cataloging training, and the complete, 
and the complete absence of any kind of system of accountability. Allow me to go into a little bit more detail about these. First, uh, with the structure of our cataloging permissions, with the way that things were, we basically had a two-tier system. If you hired a new cataloger at a, at a Spark library and you wanted to create a new staff account for them, you had two choices. You could either have them be at the lower level where they could manage local holdings and they could import single records using Z39.50. Or you could choose to let them do literally everything else, create original MARC records, edit current MARC records, delete MARC, merge MARC, manage monograph parts, overlay MARC records, do batch changes to records, import groups of MARC records, manage electronic records. It was just a system that was rife with unequal balance. Rather than the kind of fifth that you would expect with a system like this, it was more like 1585. It was almost all or nothing. You, you could either have your cataloger do the bare minimum or you could give them access to literally everything, whether they needed all that extra stuff or not. We desperately needed more options when deciding what we wanted to allow our catalogers to do. And then there was the issue of cataloger training. With the way that we have things set up, when a new cataloger was hired at an existing Spark library, training for them was arranged just by that member library. Not all of our had the resources to be able to do that job properly. And to be honest, I don't know that it was really reasonable of us to expect them to do that. When a new system migrated to Spark, for all of the new catalogers that came on there all at once, basic cataloging training was provided as an element of the migration process. And I'm not at all trying to discredit that, but the cataloging Cataloging there was just one part of the entirely new evergreen environment that people were being told about. It didn't, it couldn't have the level of depth that we needed, and it couldn't be as specifically crafted to Spark as we wanted. And in terms of supporting documentation, the, uh, the guides, the how-tos, the beginner level step-by-step -step walkthroughs with pictures and screenshots that make it absolutely clear how to do what needs to be done, no matter what your experience level, it just wasn't there. We owed it to our catalogers, to all of our catalogers. We needed to show them what to do and how to properly do it. And lastly, the matter of accountability. In any shared bibliographic catalog, there's always the potential for a lot of unintentional damage to be done. And with the way that we have things set up, there were no, there were no requirements that people had to meet before they were given access to cataloging permissions. There was no certification. There was no way for people to demonstrate that they had at least a reasonable knowledge. And from a technical standpoint, there were no restrictions on who could do the assigning. A local Spark library could create the highest level cataloger accounts. Look, there. There's a reason that we have laws saying that before people can legally drive a car, they need to pass a road test, go through driver's ed, that kind of thing. If your kid turns 18 and they say, okay, dad, I want to drive, and you just give them your keys, you really shouldn't be surprised if things start to get wrecked. But without a basic system of accountability, 
there was nothing that we could really do about it. A anyhow, um, those were the problems. Here is what we decided to do. I'll give a very quick overview of our strategy first, and then go into more details when I talk about the process of implementation. In terms of having unequal cataloging tiers, because we were unhappy with the current structure, we decided to build an entirely new one. We started from the ground up. We made a structure that had more levels, and we completely remapped what permission was assigned to each tier. To address our training needs, we created an entirely new set of standardized cataloging training courses, explain, explaining how literally how to do everything that a cataloger might need to do. We customized those courses to fit our new permission structure and to fit our unique needs. And most importantly, we made sure that all of our catalogers had access to the courses, no matter who they were or where they came from. And because we needed some way for catalogers to show accountability, we created a very rudimentary certification system, a way for catalogers to demonstrate that they had a reasonable knowledge of how to responsibly use their permissions. From a practical standpoint, I think the best way to think about this is as a knowledge check, something to complete after training was done, just so that the course content was understood. And we restricted the ability to assign the higher permission groups to Spark staff. Now that you know the gist of our plan of attack, let me share some about what it was like to put that plan into action. When it comes to creating a new creating a new permission structure. The first thing that you need to decide is how many tiers should the new system have? How many levels? How, how large? How extended should it be? Well, one of the things that we quickly discovered is that there is a very, very fine line between not having enough options and having far too many. When your staff look at a permission system, you know, for cataloging, for circulation, or whatever, it shouldn't be a complicated task for them to figure out where they belong. Another point, using a hierarchy can make things a lot easier for you. Basically, let's say that, you know, if before somebody can take training for level two of a structure, they need to start out by taking training for level one. Before somebody can train for level three, they start by training for level one, then they take level two, then they take level three, and so on. Because everything builds on itself, it saves a lot of time. Ultimately, with Spark, we decided to move to a three-tier structure. Adding just one more level, I, I, I know it doesn't seem like that big of a change, but making that small shift gave us a lot more flexibility. Once you know how many tiers you want to be working with, the next question becomes, how should you decide what permission goes to what level? Well, one, per, one, per, one approach that you could take is to match permission allocations to what the 
standard cataloging workflow looks like at your consortium. For Spark, however, this didn't, it didn't really work. As I alluded to earlier, Spark catalogers didn't have a standard workflow. We, uh, we were diverse and almost everybody did things differently. In terms of deciding what permission should go where, the best that I can suggest is this. Find a strategy that matches your basic project that matches your basic project goals and stick with it. No matter what you decide, no matter how things are allocated, it's it's impossible to make everybody happy. All that you can do is trust that your plan is for the best and wait for people to come around. In terms of what we decided to do, well, I don't mean this to sound cynical or anything, but because we were basically trying to combat human error, the basic mindset that we started with was if a person unknowingly uses a cataloging permission in the wrong way, how much accidental, how much accidental damage could they cause? And when we started ranking the permissions from least dangerous to most dangerous, we noticed that they correlated very closely with the amount of change that a person from one member institution could affect to the Spark-wide catalog. So that's basically what we went with. With the three-tiered system that we came up with, at the entry level, catalogers only have the ability to change local holdings, basically to create, edit, transfer, and delete item records. At the next level up, we introduce the ability to bring in new MARC records to the catalog using various means, C39.50, MARC batch import, that kind of thing. And finally, at the highest level, catalogers have maximum abilities. They can import new bib records, they can make changes to stuff that's already in Spark, they can create original records from scratch. That's, that's the rough outline anyway. The, um, the breakdown doesn't fit 100%, but it's close enough to work well enough for what we need. Now, I, I do have one final word to add about the permission allocation process, and that word is testing. We, uh, <laughs> we went into this process with a very good understanding of what the evergreen cataloging functions are, but it's amazing how difficult it can be for a novice to try to match up permission tasks with the actual given permission names. The, uh, the support and the patience that we got from Equinox was incredible. It was phenomenal. We never, we never could have got through this without them. But even with all of the assistance that they gave, there were several times when I thought that we finally, finally had things perfect. And then we found out that we didn't. Um, so we would strongly recommend that you involve as many people as possible from as many places as possible in the hunt for bugs and make sure that you factor in plenty of extra time to catch the missteps because the missteps, they, they're gonna show up. Now we come to the second element of our plan, training. There is no doubt in my mind, education is the cornerstone. It's the foundation of any big project like ours. But from a practical standpoint, the way that training plays out is gonna be heavily dependent on the 
cataloging environment of your consortium. Some of you listening and watching right now, you might have the resources to do live in-person testing. And if you can do that, that's, that's wonderful, that's great. But for, for Spark, that just isn't really a practical option. Spark has very few full-time employees. And as far as myself and every other person on the cataloging committee, we already have full-time jobs. We already have 40 hour a week commitments to our member local libraries. All of the committee work, all of the Spark related stuff that we do is just added on top of that. I, get, I guess what I'm getting at is that we did, we had lofty goals, but we knew that we needed to be matter of fact about how we tried to get to those goals. The first thing to consider in terms of training courses is how do you get the courses to your catalogers? Well, we, for Spark, we knew from the beginning that in-person training wasn't really an option. We just didn't have the staffing to make that happen. So online instruction was the best way for us to go. Another thing you have to think about, are you going to go with live training or pre-recorded? For us, the most practical option, again, was pre-recorded. We eventually wound up with a total of files, one for each level of the new permission system. And I think this approach has turned out very well for us. We live, we live in an on-demand world where people expect access to things at any time from any location. And with the, with the approach that we wound up going with, this lets us meet that need. Um, incidentally, the, the delivery vehicle that we wound up going with was, it's a software called GoToWebinar makes it very easy to keep track of course registration and to keep track and to contract to keep track of who's signed up and to contact them. Now when it comes to the creation and organization of your courses, the first thing that I would say is this Do not need to recreate the wheel. The content of our classes was heavily, heavily based on examples provided by Evergreen Indiana. We reached out to them very early in our process and one of their trainers was kind enough to share their PowerPoint templates, what they used in their training courses. She even let me sit in on one of their online training sessions and just incidentally, if anybody listening, if you want to steal from us, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, when you go to the screen at the final screen of this presentation, we have links that'll tell you where to go and how to get everything that we did. Another, another thought, be very methodical in how you present your content. Each of the training videos that we made is broken in, it's each of them are broken down into a dozen or more segments, and each segment is about only one function. Um, I know it sounds kind of basic, but this was absolutely key in making things accessible to everybody. And finally, before you introduce a new topic, make sure that you have already provided everything that people understand. Introduce new terminology at the beginning. Make sure that you explain theory and thinking before you show any walkthroughs. Whatever, however you present, make sure that you have a knowledge foundation already in place to support it. Once all of the, once all of the organization and the prep work is done, it came time to actually record the video footage. And there's no way to sugarcoat this. Uh, 
This took a while. But I do have a few pointers to share. When it comes to the recording process, I would strongly recommend that you do not capture footage directly from Evergreen. Rather, just take screenshots of key moments and then import them to PowerPoint and replicate the live experience. I, I will admit that taking this approach, it involves a little bit more prep work at the beginning, but the advantages more than make up for it. Allow me to give you a brief example of what I mean. What we're looking at now is it's from one of our courses that tells people how to do Z39.50. And by taking this approach, you get to put in arrows and guides on screen, basic additions that allow you to highlight exactly what part of the screen you want your audience to look at. Rather than just kind of wave a mouse around, you can make it really obvious to people Hey, everybody, look here and then look in those two places down there and then finally look here. A few other benefits of this approach. The job of editing video footage becomes much, much easier. If you need to stop recording for whatever reason and then you want to pick things up at the same place, you can guarantee that every pixel is going to be in the exact same place that it was when you stopped. And finally, by doing things this way, it makes it ridiculously easy to reuse the assets for other purposes. All you have to do is select the image from PowerPoint and copy it and paste it into Word and you're basically good to go. And finally, in regards to the training courses, well, like before, review is critical. Allow as much time as possible. Round up as many sample video watchers as you can get your hands on. We found it helpful to have one shared Google document just for basic comments by everybody. Having that basic coordination really helped keep everything together and make sure that people add timestamps for each video section that they're talking about. And lastly, the, the certification system. Before you can start work on this, there are a number of conceptual decisions that you're going to need to make. First off, who will you require to certify? Ultimately, I mean, it's up to you, but I would recommend that you be only as strict as you need to be. We at Spark, we ultimately made the decision not to require official certification for the entry level class. Basically, it was just kind of a matter of picking our battles, uh, a way to save time. None of the dangerous permissions were at that entry level. So the amount of damage that an uncertified person could do was pretty minimal. There also is the question about your current catalogers, people who are already cataloging with your system on the date that your new plan goes live. In our case with Spark, we decided that it would be best to ask them to certify. And this was strictly a matter of professional courtesy, just basically politeness. Um, if we ask new catalogers to jump through certain hoops before we let them do their jobs, it's just, it's only fair to ask to show them that we're willing to jump through those same hoops, to show them that we're, that we are willing to do anything that we ask them to do. Once all of that is decided, the next thing to think about is how will you administer the process? 
given our resources, we knew that certification would need to be done online. And like the video courses, certification would need to be automated on demand. But getting both of these things accomplished was very much easier said than done. With an automation system, with an automated system like we were, like we would need to use, there's no way to actually have the test taker use Evergreen while they're doing it. We eventually had to turn to online quiz software. For the person taking the test, I would imagine that the process is kind of like filling out a very detailed internet questionnaire. What we eventually wound up going with was a software package called LibWizard, but I imagine that you probably could accomplish most of the same ends just by getting creative with Google Forms or something similar like that. When it comes to the content of these certification quizzes, here are, th here are a few thoughts on questions. I would recommend that you organize things using exactly the same structure as the training courses. Tackle the subjects in the exact same order. If a test taker isn't sure about the answer and they want to double back and check the course, there should never be any doubt as far as where they should be looking. And finding sample mark records to use for your answers, that's probably going to take you a very, very long time. And that just can't be helped. Every question that you create, it needs to just have one correct answer and only one correct answer. And all of the incorrect answers need to be plausible, but ideally they need to be incorrect in a different way. I know it's complicated and it's a lot of effort, but for the quizzes to work, you just kind of need to do it. In terms of how to ask things, as detailed as the questions may need to be, always try to keep things as basic and as simple as you can. Don't make things super difficult just for the sake of being clever. It, it accomplishes nothing, really. And during review or during the first stages of implementation, if certain questions are being answered incorrectly by most people, and if the thing in question isn't absolutely life or death, change things up, switch things. The very last thing that you're going to need to decide upon with certification is what to do about evaluating test results. And I'm not really sure that there is one right way to approach this quandary. You can choose to take a strict pass or fail approach, but for us, ultimately, I don't think that was really the best way to go. And there are two main reasons that I say that. First, you have, to remember, you have to remember that the software being used to take the test, it isn't, it isn't evergreen. It's, it's different than the environment, than the way that things are set up when they normally are doing what they're, asked, what they're being asked to do. So the way is really, it's just needed. And aside from that, one very practical element, um, <laughs> At this point in our project, we only have one set of questions for each exam. If people fail the test, they, of course, they need to get, they need to get another shot at taking it. And if it's the exact same set of questions, it kind of defeats the purpose. So what we eventually settled on was a combination of the two things. Basically, each of our exams is divided up into multiple screens. 
and each screen contains questions about just one topic. People answer all the questions on a screen and then they click next. If everything has been answered correctly, they go on to the next portion. And if anything has been answered incorrectly, they are not allowed to move on until they go back to their answers and find their mistakes and correct them. It's admittedly a bit of a compromise, but at least it lets us know that by the time somebody has gone through the test, they've given correct answers to 100% of the questions, even if it took a few tries to get some of those questions right. So, Shell, that's our story. From start to finish, from initial proposal to go live day, the whole project took more than a year of very hard work. But, you know, the system has been in place now for a few months. So as we look back and as we analyze things, what are the lessons that I can share with you? I think they boil down to three things. Firstly, don't be afraid to suggest change. People are much, much more open than you might expect. There were a number of times when I had to break the news about what we wanted to do to new groups of people. And in each of those times, I went in thinking, thinking that I had a really hard fight in front of me. But I've got to say that I was very surprised and very happy by how eager people have been on the whole to adopt change. I truly think that as long as your plans are thought out and detailed and practical, as long as you are very intentional to emphasize how what you want to do is going to improve things, and as long as you're not just doing change for the sake of change, I think that you will be pleasantly surprised by how receptive people are. Secondly, you know, when I was trying to think about a title for this presentation, my mind immediately went to a quote that talks about parenting, namely, train up children in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, any parent who reads that quote, they will tell you that it's really more of a general principle than an absolute guarantee. And we have had to keep that same concept in mind in regards to our project. The plain hard truth is that unfortunately, you can't guarantee complete success mistakes, some mistakes are always going to happen. And you have to be honest enough to face the fact that if somebody wanted to, and if they tried hard enough, I think they probably could find a way to game our system, to game our system. That's not pessimism, that's just kind of real life. You have to keep that attitude in mind whenever you do anything big like this, or you're never going to be satisfied with what the results are. And ultimately, look, I know that I've been talking to you now for about 44 minutes and 25 seconds about how much work we've done and how long things took and how detailed the whole thing was. But if I want to leave you with one final thought, let it be this. All of our effort has been paid back in spades. From the catalogers that I've spoken with individually, from the people who manage catalogers that I've heard from, and from the improvements that we and that everybody are, are that everybody are already starting to see with how Evergreen looks to everybody. Folks, we are finally creating a solid foundation to base Spark's catalog on. 
I can't tell you what things are going to look like for us by the end of the year. And I have no idea how things are going to look in two years, in five years, but I can't wait to find out. So in conclusion, don't ever, don't ever hesitate to rethink. Don't ever be a don't ever be afraid to re-examine your basic approach to cataloging or to any aspect of librarianship. I can testify, it pays off. Well, that's essentially all that I have to present for you. If any of you have questions or you want to reach out to me later, to, uh, comments or whatever, you can see my contact information is here. And if you are curious to see the training courses that we've done, or just to directly look at the PowerPoint presentations, all of the, all of the uh, links that you need should be right there in the file. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. A lot of really great responses from everybody, overwhelmingly positive response for your um, presentation. We do have some questions in here, but because we have just a few minutes before we got to get the next oh, one yeah. going, it's okay. Um, I'll ask a couple of them, and if anyone has not had their questions answered, I encourage you also to po possibly check in on the um, open discussions. I think there's one for cataloging specifically, so um, you can definitely pop in there and ask as well if uh, Jonathan is around. Absolutely. So let's sure. kind of go back. All right. So one question was, uh, can the mid-level group edit records that they import if the records from Z3950 or vendors don't correspond to your cataloging best practices? Uh, they do have the chance to do that during the import process, yes. Um, if a level two cataloger looks in Spark and they don't find what they need, they have the option to look out in C3950 or wherever. And if the record that they find doesn't match what we want, they have a chance before officially bringing it into Spark, they do have the chance to edit it and to make the corrections that they feel that we need. Okay, uh, this next question is from John. It says, do you know if your network has similar structure for training or certification for other library staff, for example, staff that process circulation and holds? To tell the truth, we do not at the moment, no. Um, I know there has, I've heard some people talk, there may be some plans like that in the future, but uh, for the moment, I do not have anything concrete that I can share with you, unfortunately. Okay. Um, one question I think is answered by this slide, which is how exactly do we get access to the cataloging training? <laughs> yep. Seems to be there a you link go. right there. And so. just one thing to comment, if you do go to click the link for the training courses, it is going to ask you to put in your Spark location. And you don't have to worry if you're not actually from Pennsylvania. You can put whatever you like there. It just wants some kind of text. Um, just enter whatever and click submit, and you should be good to go. Okay. Um, do you envision refresher courses for certified staff? Um, that is something we have thought about. Um, to, to tell the truth, that isn't, we don't have any current plans for that. The approach that we more take in Spark, we have what we call cataloging town halls every two or three times a year where we let current staff get, get together and ask questions, ask for demonstrations. Um, that's more the vehicle that we use to let people ask for questions and ask for refreshers in individual topics. All right, and this uh, last one, just for the interest of time, uh, do you have any docs from the which permissions for which tasks parts of the tree you ended up with? Uh, we do, actually, yes. Um, and 
I actually will make sure that I import a link for that into the final version of the PowerPoint slide that goes. But if you look in the training courses, each one of them, after the introduction, gives an outline of specifically what each level in our system is able to do. So looking there or in other places, I'll make sure that that information does get out there. All right, great. Well, thank you again, Jonathan, so much. Uh, was there any other comments you wanted to uh, mention? Closing? I believe that's it. Thank okay. you, everyone. Yeah, th uh, great session. Um, great stuff. And again, this is recorded so that we will be able to rewatch this or if you popping in from the next one, haven't got a chance to take a look at this, no worries. You can watch it uh, post-conference. So I'm um, sorry that I couldn't get through all the questions. It was a very engaging conversation. But again, um, I'm certain that you could message Jonathan or also if you want to pop into an open discussion room, we have several available. Uh, and also take a look at the expo, uh, see what the exhibitors have up before the next track. And we got, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for the next session here.